Welcome. Uh, thank you uh, for joining us. Uh, you're here for the live stream artist talk for Elements, um, Nature, Art, and Impact. We've got all three of our amazing artists with us here uh, to share insights into their process, their inspirations, uh, their techniques. And I think you're all in for a pretty great, uh, a pretty great conversation with them. Uh, my name is Stephen Snyder. I'm the gallery and communications coordinator for the West Vancouver Community Arts Council, and we are thrilled to be presenting this exhibition um, at the Silk Purse Arts Center in West Vancouver, uh, which is on the unceded and traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples. Uh, that would be the Squamish Nation, the Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and the Musqueam Nation. And we are incredibly grateful to our host nations, neighbors, and community members for their stewardships of these beautiful lands since time immemorial. If you watching have any questions or comments for our three artists, you can drop those in the chat and we will get to that uh, throughout the course of this discussion. And anyone uh, who's watching this post uh, live, um, if you have questions or comments for them in the future, um, we've got links to uh, their websites and social media in the description of this video. So you can reach out that way. So elements. Nature Art Impact is on display at the Silk Purse until June 25th. It's a pretty stunning collection of artwork by three talented artists, Jungmin An, Wayne Bueller, and Monica Gewurz. And their artwork explores um, various ways in which art has a uh, voice in the climate conversation. Um, and we will hear more about that. But first, Let's meet our fantastic artists. So uh, you'll get to hear a little bit from them about them and their background um, and their career. Jungmin, let's start with you. If you could please introduce yourself to everyone. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Jungmin. I am a Korean artist, well, hyper-realist artist. Um, I lived in Bangladesh for the past 10 years during my high school years and I came to Canada to attend university at Emily Carr and I graduated with BFA and since then I've been producing paintings and I, of course I mainly focus on still lifes on um, painting trash and realistically as I can um, just depicting those garbages into you know beautiful objects awesome great thank you uh thank you for sharing uh Sounds like I think everyone's going to have a pretty interesting journey that they're going to share with us on how they how they came to art and, and where they've been on this fantastic world that we're on. Uh, Wayne, could you please introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, my name is Wayne Bueller. Um, I live in North Van, and I am um, an artist who specializes and focuses on painting with oil paint on copper that uh, you'll see that in all my work. Um, long time ago, I had a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree from UBC in art history and philosophy. And I pursued a career also in designing and building. And now I've decided to focus on painting again. I did paint for a while. I did have some shows and I have some stuff done. And now this is the latest that I'm working on. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you, Wayne. Um, and last but certainly not least, Monica, please please tell us a bit about yourself. Good evening, uh, evening everybody. I'm Monica Gewirtz. I'm a mixed media contemporary artist. I live in beautiful Lions Bay, just uh, north of West Vancouver. I am a bit different than the two other artists. I have, uh, I'm a scientist, an ecologist, and a landscape architect by profession. And art is my second career. I graduated from Emily Carr uh, with the Advanced Painting Certificate. And I hopped on just in 2015 and uh, to do paintings. My art is rooted in the Pacific West Coast. I'm very inspired on seascapes and sunsets, but also where I travel. 
And what's unique of my art? I use terroir or sand from where I travel. I use upcycle materials like textiles and paper. I use silver and gold leaf. And uh, I started doing acrylic. I transitioned a bit to acrylic and oil. And now I'm exploring incorporating more sustainable materials in my art using natural pigments and binders. And uh, I'll tell you more about it when we see one of my art pieces. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much, everyone, for, for sharing uh, a little bit about yourselves. Uh, now we're going to take a, uh, a quick tour of the exhibition um, that's up right now. Uh, it's just a, a little sample uh, to get your appetites whetted. So you come on down to the Silk Purse and see everything in person. So we're going to pull that up uh, right now. So this is kind of what you see if you come in off of our waterfront uh, entrance um, here at the Silk Purse. We've got bios. Um, guest book for everyone. And then we uh, start over here on this side with Jung Min's artwork, these really captivating and bold oil paintings. Which as you were saying uh, in your introduction, uh, Jung Min trying to find the beauty in trash, and I have to say these are these are quite beautiful considering the subject matter. There's there's a really great sense of light and color. And then we move into some work here from Monica. Something about your work that's very interesting is how textural it is, as you can as you can see here in these shots. And uh, the metallic, the metallics that you use really, really make it stand out as well. So far. Um, as we've been going through, as everyone watching can see, um, when we get to Wayne, you'll notice even more. But these three artists are very uh, different in their subjects and their styles, uh, their approaches, even their medium. Um, but uh, but it all it all works together. Yeah. Now we move on to into to Wayne's fantastic work. You know, I'm sure we'll hear more about later, but to, to see oil paint on copper is is pretty unique. It's not it's not necessarily something that I've I don't think I've seen in in person before. There's, there's a there's a lot of a lot of really interesting pieces to take in and and, and sections of pieces. I think when you come and see the gal uh, see the exhibit, you can really kind of focus in on on various elements of each artwork and and really hone in and figure out what it means to you, maybe what it meant to the artist when they made it. Try and figure out how they did it. And the variety, um, not only in styles and media, but but sizes and surfaces is also, I think, pretty engaging and uh, makes for an interesting viewing experience for visitors. Yeah, just another, another quick walk through. 
the gallery. Which, as you can kind of see right here, uh, if you haven't been to the Silk Purse, it's it's right on the waterfront in in Ambleside, so it's it's a very suiting space uh, for this exhibition. So that's just a quick a quick idea of what you can expect, but you really have to come and see these pieces up close and and personal to really get us a, a sense of of what's going on with them. Uh, and again, uh, it's on at the Silk Purse until uh, June 25th. Uh, so now we're going to get a little bit of a closer look at one piece of art. Each artist has selected one work of art that's on display that they're going to talk about um, and how it relates to sort of their overall body of work. Uh, so since we started with Jungmin in introductions, we'll go in reverse um, and we'll start with Monica um, with your artwork. Which actually, now that I think of it, it did not get in the video because it's behind uh, the reception desk. So uh, we get a, a great chance to see it right now. All right, Monica, could you please tell us about this fantastic painting? Well, uh, Steve, remind me, what's the name of it? <laughs> <laughs> it is called Blue Zone. Blue Zone. Okay. Well, a bit, a bit how this links to my art work, my art career, but also to this exhibition. So, as I mentioned early, I am a, a scientist and an artist. And I, my science background allows me to analyze information, but also, uh, and my artistic background allows me to express that. So for me, climate change, pollution, carbon footprint are very close issues to, to my heart. So I think art can convey what words cannot. So a lot of my art has a hidden message. First, it looks like a, a seascape, a sunset, um, you know, the golden hour, the magic hour. But some of these paintings, especially this one, also because of the horizon line, is not just a transition between the sky and water, but in this case is a line indicating raising waters from our glaciers melting at a very rapid pace. Some, the red on the horizon is purposely also to indicate the a line of fire from all our very common now and intense wildfires that we experience, especially here in BC. So, they're beautiful, but they have that hidden message. Um, so as people view my art, it's uh, I want to send a message of, of thought, of nature and environment, how fragile we are. In addition to that, I, uh, um, I like to use upcycled materials in my art. In Blue Zone, I have used tissue paper and uh, I used here acrylic uh, paint, but it's a very unique acrylic paint. It's, um, I'll show you later on, it's a natural acrylic that has come out based, uh, it's a plant base. So there's really not acrylic which contains plastics, but it's a plant based algae and wood, and it's archival. And I've used natural pigments like, uh, like the, the sienas, the cochinelle, which is the, it looks like a ladybug that, that it gets crushed. And that's how uh, rouge lipstick was uh, initially created before all the synthetics came out. Um, I, my paintings are meant to be touched. Yes, you didn't hear wrong, touched. You can touch <laughs> my paintings because I feel um, it gives a different perception and also I want to allow the visually impaired to also um, appreciate my art, not just visually, but tactile. 
I like to use bling. I like to use silver and gold leaf. The photo cannot, you cannot see it in the, in, in the camera, but you, that's why you have to go see this exhibit because you cannot reproduce this uh, with the camera because I wanted to capture the luminosity during the sunset, the reflection. For me, it's mesmerizing. Every sunset is different. So I use the, the metallics. And um, it's, I don't depict a place. I never paint something that it's, oh, this is, uh, you know, the Caribbean, or this is Mexico, or this is Whistler. For me, is is for the viewer to find its own space uh, and allow the viewer to enter my multiple layers, the shades and texture of the work, and be seduced into a visual, visual and visceral encounter, uh, holistic minds of between myself, the artist, and them, the viewer, inspiring self-discovery, empathy, meditation, and mindfulness. Excellent. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Okay. Oh, yes. I forgot the, there are other paintings in the exhibit, as you could see, and some depict the, the more abstract. There's one large painting called Silver Lining. That is drought. It depicts how parched the land is uh, due to our now common and severe droughts. Some of the paintings are, uh, as this one, rising waters. Some are wildfires. And some are just people to be zen. Yeah. Thanks. No, thank you for that addendum. Because as you mentioned, it's, it's really interesting because you're trying to give people uh, something to think about, um, but also something beautiful to look at. Um, so I think that that's a really interesting uh, combination of uh, missions, I suppose, uh, with your artwork. And with, with an abstract piece, it's, it's uh, ho hopefully uh, it's easier to get that across. Yeah. One thing I didn't mention is a lot of people ask me why I don't sign my paintings. They are signed at the back. I don't like to sign them in the front because some people like to put my paintings on another orientation, <laughs> uh, <laughs> especially the abstract. So I leave people the freedom to do that. So yeah. they are indeed signed. And um, I, am, I am an international artist. I do sell internationally and I'm also in, uh, represented by, by local galleries. So... Uh, um, it's, it's a fantastic opportunity to, to be at the SIP first and, and be again in West Van. So thank you again for the opportunity, Stephen. Oh, totally. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing your artwork. Um, so getting back to, uh, these sort of natural paints that you're using, how did you come about discovering, discovering them and wanting to use them? Well, I've been searching about, uh, I learned that acrylic paints are really pigments suspended in m minute particles of plastic. And which uh, it's not so much the use of acrylic, it's the disposal of the acrylic. A lot of artists wash their brushes and, and wastewater down the drain, which ends up in our rivers, lakes, and the oceans. And then all these little particles get eaten by algae and then by fish. and gets accumulated in the food chain, not much different than pesticides and other uh, wonderful toxic materials. So I started doing some research, going back to what the masters use and, and uh, what they're using in Europe and in some parts of the States. And I found that there's been quite a bit of a move to move away from acrylic paints back to oil paints, which are oil with pigments. And start, um, I start playing with them here. And then I was lucky to be in an art residence in France in April. And that allowed me time to really experiment with all these natural acrylic that I mentioned earlier and waxes and oils and that are archival. So 
I think I would like to maybe move to not 100% replace yet, but maybe 60, 70% replace the, my, the use of acrylic paints and be uh, more conscious about how I dispose of my wasted paint and palette. And uh, natural pigments have been around since the caveman. So it's not new, there's nothing new. It's just how we can incorporate in a contemporary way. And I'm really excited about it. Um, there's, uh, uh, thank God, a movement on the big industry to start moving away from, from the toxic acrylic paints. Yeah, no. And I can fun. show after when you, I can, I can show people if they're interested what the pigment looks like and what this acrylic, natural acrylic looks like. It's really cool. Great. Yeah, no, that's that's pretty exciting. Uh, thank you for sharing it. Thank you for discussing uh, something that I don't know everyone necessarily thinks about uh, when it comes to art making is what are what are the long term effects of what we use, what we don't use, how we dispose of it. That was that's a really important thing that as art makers and people in the art industry, something uh, for us to all all consider. So oh, now, uh, now we're going to hear from Wayne. You've got a great uh, painting that you've done. I'm just going to pull that up. All right, Wayne, could you please tell us about your fantastic work of art here? Okay, so this is called Copper Sockeye Copper River. It is uh, depicts obviously sockeye salmon. Um, swimming up a, up a river to, and it's shown as moving from left to right in a continuous movement. And when there's actual, when there's actual movement, like if you're walking along beside the painting and you look at it, it appears that the rippled copper at the bottom is moving. And also on the top, shining lights and everything, move across the painting and it gives it a sense of movement that I really like. Um, but on the information that I gave to you, uh, I said that my art envisions a healthy and natural world. And that's really what this is about. I like to try to capture the peace of mind that comes from natural beauty. And um, if I can do that, then that's perfect. Um, this was a major work. It was one of the first that I did on copper and um, took a long time, but it took, I had to sort of try to define what it is that I was doing. And the, um, the history, first of all, of painting on copper goes right back to the Middle Ages and a nod down through the history of art. And uh, artists along the way have all, have, many of them have painted on copper like Rembrandt, et cetera. But they, they use their pigment in more of an opaque way. And except on paintings sometimes of like um, flowers where they wanted to have a bit of lightness and brightness, they would thin out the pigment. My pigment, my paint is put on extremely thinly. It's diluted and diluted and it gets many coats. And then I'm, I'm working it so that I can get the reflections that I want. Also the direction of the grain of, of each piece. And um, so, my stuff is transparent pigment, paint, and applied in such a way that many coats give me the dimension that I want, and then the whole thing is varnished. So uh, in this particular piece, the black area is, it's just black paint, but the, it appears flat because I used a, uh, a matte varnish. Um, I painted it shiny black at first and it didn't look good because you get the reflections of the viewer in it and the room and everything and it really made it confusing. The, uh, so I got rid of that and painted it this way. Now the, um, as far as the, out, first of all, West Coast art is probably, most people know, is a, a lot of it is done on copper by people like, for instance, the Haida Nation and local and other nations. This is not an attempt to mimic their style. This is an attempt to paint in using materials which have traditionally been used on the West Coast in various ways. 
especially since the arrival of the Russians and the British in their wood ships on up the west coast, and they had uh, they had uh, copper sheeting on the hulls so that they wouldn't foul. Plants wouldn't adhere as easily. The ships could go quicker, faster. And when the uh, Russians and the other people showed up with these big sheets of copper, um, that provided copper here on the north, on the west coast. But uh, native people have been taking copper from rivers. Uh, long, long before that, and making tools and making weapons and et cetera, small pieces that were pounded out and, and bigger ones pounded into sheets. But um, this piece is on one big sheet of copper and uh, it is glued, adhered to a solid backing so that it doesn't move. And the, uh, the details of the set, the shape of the fish is just what I came up with looking at pictures of these fish. And also when I was a kid, I lived on uh, Vancouver Island, not far from Alert Bay, but on Vancouver Island, and had lots of opportunity to see fish. I, I was out in the bush a lot. We lived there and got to see nature very up close and became very much attached to things natural. So looking at this, the lines of the fish are continuous, sinuous, and I'm hoping to, to strike something that looks realistic of the fish, but at the same time has, when you look at it, there's a sense of calm beauty about it. I like the calmness of it. Um, the uh, fish themselves, the green and the red, that's another reason why I paint them versus uh, other fish or even, or even sockeye salmon when there's still a silver tone is because they're, they're colorful, they're really nice colors. And uh, the pigments that I can get that would allow me to see through the pigment can be done, the red especially, but the, the, I can paint the heads with a coat of green over an undercoat of yellow and other colors and still get a bit of transparency in and the eyes look realistic. And yeah, it took forever, but it was well worth it. And it sort of made me realize where I was going to be going in the future with the other paintings. Um, yeah, um, by the way, as a side note to what uh, we've been talking about already, um, all the paintings in this show are amazing. I, I really strongly recommend everyone to come down and look at the stuff in the gallery because the photography does not do justice to some of the details in these paintings. You get little speckles of what looked like gold colored stuff in the paintings or a painting that makes it look like reflecting metal bent. It's a, quite, a, quite an achievement. So anybody at all, make sure you get down here and see this stuff because it's very good. Thank you. Um, that's a great plug and you're totally right, Wayne. You really have to come down and, and, and yeah. see it in person. Um, yeah. I love that we're getting uh, a bit of a history lesson, uh, a little bit of a science lesson. Um, it's art can art can teach us so many different things. And you're talking about painting um, with layers on the copper mm -hmm. um, and achieving. Well, what, may I add one thing? Yeah, please. Okay. Um, first of all, I don't feel ever confrontational. I'm not confrontational about anything. I'm not. I'm not saying that. The way copper is used or the way it's uh, where it's mined or anything like that, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in just using that material, which we do get from British Columbia, using mm -hmm. it in a way like this, which is another facet of copper. And uh, so I'm, I'm calm, I'm at ease with everything, <laughs> and uh, I just want people to feel the joy of seeing beauty and appreciate that and take that with them when they're going about their lives. Oh, totally. Yeah. No, we could we can all use use a little bit of that, that that spark, that that mm -hmm. calmness, that serenity. Yeah, no, that's any questions? Yeah, I did have some questions about um just uh the layer talking about layering, um, and in some of the pieces, some of the smaller pieces, maybe it's a little bit more evident. Um but almost every inch of your work is covered in paint, correct? Yes. Um, sure. Because you, some of the, the undulation is caused by paint, not like the warping of the metal. Oh, there's no warping of the metal, no. Yeah. This is all, although, hey, to, uh, to answer you, I see where you're going with this. Across the bottom of this painting, 
which it's very, very obvious. What I'm using there is an abrasive. So I'm taking an abrasive that's uh, quite quite a strong abrasive. Like I, I don't like to say sanding paper, but it gets the idea across. And dragging that from one side to the other and moving it up and down to create that those reflections which create the ripple look. So if you could look closely at it, you would see stripe or look like very minor scratches, if you will, moving across the painting. And, and when there's movement, like when you walk past it, or if you put a light past it, et cetera, it looks like that is moving because of that. Every other, every other inch um, of this painting has been handled in that way with an abrasive is just to different degree of how abrasive it is. That's it. Yeah, no, it's it's amazing. It must have taken a lot of experimenting uh, to be able to master something like this. It's a case, yeah, it's a case of experimenting that's true. And um, having people say to me, are you still working on that? <laughs> um, but also uh, there's a moment in uh, sometimes with painting whereby it just um, doing it and doing it and doing it and suddenly it's like, here we are, that's it. And that's, that's great. Totally. Awesome, great. Thanks so much uh, for sharing, Wayne. Mm -hmm. uh, and now uh, we're gonna talk, uh, talk about a great uh, painting from Jung Min. I'm just gonna pull that up. Awesome. All right, gentlemen, please tell us about your fantastic oil painting here. Um, where do I begin? <laughs> well, the, the idea of my painting is, of course, the correlation between the environment and capitalism and, of course, the modern society that we live in. Um, it, it, they all tend to actually link all together. It's just that as we live in the like, 21st century, a lot of things that we want can be... Um, received or like reached within our like distance you want something you drive away or you give a call something comes to you and it makes a great convenience but of course uh with that convenience there's always consequences to our environment um a lot of products nowadays comes with a uh, like beautiful um, labels and decoration and nothing wrong with it it's just a one of the way of sailing it uh but once again uh, it end of the day those waste those go to garbage and of course, it does have an effect on our environment. Um, so is in certain things that, that mean does not actually have any value, such as like the Red Bull. It's an empty can that I drank and I crumbled it. The, it. the can itself no longer holds a value, maybe 25 cents for deposit. But besides that, it doesn't hold the value itself. And, and the way I paint, um, I'm interested in like, presenting the garbage in such a way that it draws the people to have a look at it. And by painting um, the painting the object in details, um, try, I'm trying to convey that it, that's how important it is to uh, put the amount of time and effort into the trash. Uh, I could have just taken a photograph and splashed it there. Of course, it could be there. But by painting it, creating layers of colors, getting the colors right the way I want it, um, that's one of the messages I'm trying to um, deliver. That's how important it is. Um, and here it is. Look at it. Appreciate the beautiful garbage and think about the things that we do that could potentially uh, affect our environment. And unfortunately, the capitalism nowadays is, so obscures the value of the objects that we actually, some of the things do not have. Wow. Yeah. No, thank you. It It really does force you to consider the work because as you said you have to consider all of the time that you have put into making a painting like this which I can imagine is quite a while to to be able to capture the light reflecting off of off of the metal and all of these intricate bends and and folds um yeah it, it really does make you stop and and consider not only how the piece was made but but why you're choosing to paint something like this? Um, well, right here, we have a Red Bull in front of us, but like 
for other viewers, if they do come to galleries, there will be other paintings. Um, there aren't only cans out there. I do paint other garbage out there. <laughs> Um, it's not always about like empty cans crushed. It's about just regular object that is, you know, unnecessary packaging as well. So such as mm. like, I'm, I'm sure it's there too for a reason, but at the same time, does a cookie really need a plastic bag around it just for, for the protection? It could easily be in a regular paper bag and open it up and eat it. So it's not only about cans, but also just the overall idea of just waste in general that we like don't think about. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Like two of the two of the other pieces, um, if anyone remembers from the tour, there was, yeah, there was the cookie, like the Starbucks cookie and then and that sort of lollipop looking thing. And and even the this can here, the colors are so bright and vibrant. And and at first glance, it's kind of happy, you know, like it, it's a, it's kind of a joyful sort of thing. But then you look at it and you're like, oh, I'm I'm looking at a piece of garbage. Should, should I be so happy looking at it? But I think that's that's one of the testaments to your your skill in in color usage and composition and lighting is that you can have this life in these inanimate objects um, that I think translates to viewers. Well, thank you. Awesome. So what and what inspired you initially to uh, obviously thoughts on consumerism and the environment are are on everyone's minds. Um, but what initially made you think well what if i what if i take waste and and that's my way of exploring these thoughts and ideas um i lived in three different countries and the way individually of course different policies but this is the way bangladesh handles uh, recycling versus the way korea uh, handles recycling and canada handles um they're all different actually um unfortunately um bangladesh do not recycle. I do see a lot of um, people who just dumps in organic waste and regular garbage and recycling all into one, and those be dumped into rivers or uh, unfortunately land, like landfills. But whereas in Korea is extremely um, restricted, they have plastic, but not only for plastic, they have um, hard plastic, bendable plastic, and they have labels for every um, object that has to be recycled in such a way. And Canada is well regulated to where um, garbage is, you know glass, organic waste, and garbage. Um, looking at those, I, I also live in apartments. I can tell by how much people waste overall uh, per day. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, it is large amount. And that's something that we see. And sometimes people don't think about it. Out of sight, out of mind. It's like using a washroom. You wash your hands. You don't think about the dirt that goes afterwards. It's just, of course, we like to have... Um, convenient and beautiful things in front of us is just that what's left behind us is something that we have to think about our future um, people as well. No, 100%. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you for sharing that, Jungmin. And thank, thank you again, Monica and Wayne, for, for discussing your pieces as well. It's pretty interesting to see and to hear uh, all of the sort of connective elements, um, even though your, your work is also, is also different from each other. Um, you're all sort of tackling uh, our relationship with the natural world around us um, in different ways. Uh, and also there's also kind of a, a, a metallic <laughs> theme as well, which was uh, in, in terms of some of the materials you're, you're using or some of the, the subjects that you're depicting. Um, so that's, that's pretty- May I add a comment? Please. Okay, so um, first of all, I have Indian status, okay? I am, I'm a status Indian. Um, my, my first nation is the Simk First Nation. They are uh, located up the North Thompson River, and uh, that is a little bit east and north of Kamloops, to put it into to scope. And um, uh, people of the rivers, actually, they're called it, the name of the of the, the group, the people of the rivers. And the, the rivers that I've, in some of the other paintings I've done is, are, are rivers that would be found in British Columbia in other locations. And um, while they're not photographically correct, I'm trying to get the idea across that um, what 
we're, what we're all basically talking about here, um, this natural beauty, which is precious, and we should do everything we can to make sure that it's going to last. Um, yeah, it's as simple as that. I, I, I take a walk outside and I see the beautiful trees and can breathe in the, the air here. And I think this has to be made to last. And um, that's, that's another, that's a theme under all of it. And uh, I could not echo that, uh, Wayne, the same as uh, for my artwork, you know, that uh, it's depicting beauty, it's engaging with the viewer, but nature is so fragile, so fragile. And with uh, abuse of, uh, you know, cutting trees, dumping waste in rivers, draining rivers and lakes for watering, for watering golf mm -hmm. courses or more subdivisions. It, you know, where this is not, there's no infinitum, there's limits. And uh, I think we as artists, we have to keep conveying that message. Uh, you know, some do it in a more, you know, not so nice way. I think us as artists, we could show in this, in this show, we could convey the messages in a in a nice, beautiful way, in a very professional, artistic, and also beautiful way. But you're buying on. No, exactly, because that's that's what art does. Uh, it has the ability to tell our stories uh, and to convey messages and change people's minds, um, hopefully for the better, to inspire them in in whatever journey they may be on. Well, Monica, I think you had a little bit of show and tell that you you teased earlier. I'd be really interested in, in seeing what these natural pigments look like. Well, so this is what a natural pigment looks like. It's a powder. Can you see it? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So Opus carries now some of them and desserts. You could buy them on the line. There is called Earth Paint. And uh, Maiwa textiles, a lot of the artists I met uh, during the show, they, they're also textile artists, so they can use that. You could also use coffee grains, you could use wine, you could use a lot of the plant materials, organics that we even have around, it doesn't have to be bought, but it has to be ground very fine to work, to be able to mix it with the binder. So this is the acrylic medium, which has no acrylic. It's a natural acrylic. They keep their, it's done by earth paint. They're based in the States, but they have distribution in Canada. And it's archival and it behaves and it's as versatile as acrylic medium. You can use it as a gel, you could dilute it. And it's basically, they don't tell you top secret recipe patent, but it's basically cellulose and algae with some preservatives. So this, this jar is $26 online. Um, and then when you mix it, I mix my pigments because they're fine with, uh, with a palette knife on a, on a glass surface. And these are, an example of all the colors one can get. There's hundreds natural pigments and more colorful pigments like earthy and me. Uh, you can also do metallics, they're mica based. And for the oil painters, I use the gallon blend solvent free gel. Has no petroleum, it does not smell. It's based with safflower oil. Mm. And so you get your pigment, you could mix it with this or with any other oil medium you have, one uses. Some people like to use uh, the heavier ones. And then if you do a lot, Opu sells these tubes like this, but they're open at the top. So you mix your pigment, and then you, you fill the 
aluminum tube and then you clamp this down and then you roll it with a plier and you have your own paint. Very cool. So it's, it, for me it was, because I was traveling, it was very easy at, because a lot of airports don't allow you to travel with paints, either acrylic or oil, they, they seize them. So if you have your little powder and label them properly and then you got your medium and and it could be also just oil like if you want if you paint very thin it like Wayne does so I finding it's 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 a bit on the versatile and then again to dispose even their water soluble and all that I I I do it in a palette scrunch my palette when I finish and I keep it in a bag and when I have a lot I take it to a place where I dispose the paints nice that's great. Thanks for, for sharing that. I think that's information that uh, people will be really interested to hear about what they could do with with their art practice. Speaking of and, art practice. And, yeah. and, and I forgot <laughs> this um, natural acrylic medium can be mixed with an acrylic as well. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. It, it can be to, to bulk it up or whatnot. And I've worked on that on smaller paintings. I haven't ventured on the larger scale. But that's in their website, they say it, you can mix it. So cool. Maybe not 100% replace, but even a little bit, it's better than using 100% acrylic. Yeah, no, totally. We all, we all have to kind of find our way to do, to do what we can. Yeah. And one thing I forgot, because I'm using the pigments and a bit like Wayne, I go layers. A lot of my paintings are layered and I go opaque and thin and scrape. So a lot of people ask how long it takes us to do a painting, how many hours. And, and, and we don't go by hours, right? We work a few hours and we come back. But it's their labor intensive because it's not a one. We're not painting windows. We're not painting doors. It's, it's the layering that makes them uh, unique and deep and interesting. Oh, very much so, yeah. There's, you can definitely see that in, in all three of your artwork, how, how intensely you are tackling your medium and your subject. There's, there's a lot of skill and a lot of, a lot of care uh, put into your artwork. Thank you. Um, I was curious to hear from all three of you with everything we've been talking about tonight, kind of where do you see your art practice going in terms of anything like style, subject matter, uh, media, where you want to go? Just what, what are kind of your, your thoughts for the future of, of your art practice? Anyone can jump in. Somebody, please. <laughs> <laughs> well, for me, it's... Um... I am getting more and more involved with my art for fundraising for environmental causes and uh, to convey the message. So I think conveying the message to a wider audience of our environmental issues being climate change, plastic pollution, carbon footprint, and and allow or, and, and, expo and help more organizations uh, in their fundraising. Um, I would like to do a show in, in Europe. That's my goal in, in the next couple of years. But at the same time, I still want to keep my art affordable and uh, to, to allow a wide audience to be able to uh, enjoy my art. And definitely, I will strive to get my art to be more eco art, more sustainable, and and educate other artists that there are alternatives to the same old same old uh, acrylic work, and have more shows at the Silk Purse. <laughs> Am I waiting? You're on the screen. Oh, okay. So. Uh, to answer that question, I would say that um, there's two things that, that determine that would determine the direction that I would go in. Um, one is the imagery, of course, 
And the other one is the materials that I work with. Um, you know, um, using, uh, ex expanding the use of uh, the, the pigments on the copper. Um, of course, changing the imagery, it could become more abstract. It could be, um, uh, and that would be interesting because I don't know exactly what direction that abstraction would be. Um, it would probably be um, something that doesn't take forever to paint, some, something that speeds things up. And uh, as far as the materials go, um, that too. I mean, I, I will probably look at uh, finding someone that has the mechanical means to, to prep the surface the way I want it done uh, mechanically so that I'm not there doing every inch of it. But um, that's the direction I would have to go. So it'd be a bit of a discovery for me and uh, that would make it certainly make it fun. Um, yeah, it would be an interesting, an interesting thing to, one more thing I wanted to remark about was we we're talking about um, pigments and uh, the color, the colors that one can use on copper as I do in that manner are very limited. The colors, um, you, you, I use transparent pigments and some are very difficult to lay on, like blue is especially a, uh, a challenge because um, if you put it on over copper, it mixes with the color of the copper to produce this very unattractive green. It looks very unattractive. So it means underlaying that blue with white and then painting it up over that. So there's, there are certain restrictions in painting on copper that dictate what your color scheme will be. And, uh, and I would say that you could probably sense that by looking at my paintings, you'll see many reds, which are they're good. Um, black is black. Um, the blues have to be a certain way. Uh, yellow, transparent yellow, great. Transparent orange, it's okay. Um, yeah. So what's going to happen in the future? I'm not exactly sure, but um, it'll be a road of discovery that uh, will be fun. Amazing. Um, Zhang Min, where do you see your practice uh, moving towards? Oof. Um, <laughs> I'll be working on a larger painting, so I can hopefully in the future I can do even larger paintings than what I have mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, I live in an apartment, so I can, uh, there's a restriction size, but so hopefully when I live in a house, I can paint as big as I can. Um, I am currently working on different theme, not so much as like out of the tr trash, but within the trash, but within the um, organic, uh, like ocean life with the frozen food, like frozen fish. And mm -hmm. I, I won't go into details because I don't want to spoil it, but <laughs> with the aquarium, so you know, with the ocean, um, so I can work on those and then work on more in depth with this environment and hopefully... Um, you know, of course, more exhibitions. Oh, amazing! That sounds like like a great journey that you're all you're all embarking on uh, as creatives. Mm -hmm. uh, so thank you, uh, Jungmin and Wayne and Monica, for sharing these insights with us um, and for sharing your fantastic artwork in this exhibition. Again, you can catch elements nature art impact at the silk purse until june the 25th so please come on down uh see this artwork uh and experience it for yourself and if you want to know more about our artists as we mentioned in the description of this video you can find links to their websites and social media so you can stay up to date uh with what they are doing so thank you everyone for joining us and I hope you all have a wonderful and creative rest of your day. Take care and we'll see you next time. Thank you, thank Stephen. You. Thank you. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.